Welcome to FAIR's Football People Festival. FAIR is an international body that works to combat inequality in football and use sport for social change. It is a network that works globally with football's governing bodies, leagues, clubs, international NGOs, and fans to tackle discrimination in and through the game. Thank you for having us today, FAIR. This festival, the Football People Festival, is an online festival of ideas that is part of FAIR's Football People Weeks, which is the largest campaign for equality and diversity in global football with over 150,000 people across the world participating in activities every year. It's the festival's inaugural year, which is very exciting, and has 12 sessions over five days tackling the big issues around social change in and through football globally. It's very exciting to be a part of this. If you're on social media right now, please use the hashtag football people, all one word when posting about this and any other panels that you watch. We are here today to talk about gendered violence within sport and specifically within soccer, or as I know you all say, football. To that end, it's very possible that we're gonna cover issues that will activate or trigger some people watching, so please take care of yourselves. Also, we're gonna talk for about 40, 45 minutes. There will be time at the end to ask questions. Please submit any questions that you have that you would like the panelists to talk about in the chat there in the on the YouTube platform. My name is Jessica Luther and I'm an investigative journalist and author. I live in Austin. Four years ago, I published a book called Unsportsmanlike Conduct, College Football and the Politics of Rape, which was about American football and institutional issues with how collegiate programs handled reports of gendered violence. A lot of my work revolves around this particular issue, looking at how institutions respond to reports of gendered violence and the impact of that on survivors. I also co-host a weekly feminist sports podcast called Burn It All Down, where we talk about these kind of things a lot. And I'm the co-author of a new book, Loving Sports When They Don't Love You Back, which you can see behind me because I only have one place in my house where I can do Zoom things. <laughs> and so it's already set up for the promotion for that. I think it makes the most sense for our distinguished panelists that are here with me today to introduce themselves. So Saul, why won't you get us started? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm really happy and also just very humbled to uh, speak among uh, you three. So yeah, I'm Saul. I'm from Germany. I'm a researcher at the University of Warwick. I'm about to hand in my PhD thesis next week. So it's an exciting time wow. at the moment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, my research is set in applied linguistics and I'm focusing on football. Uh, in my master's thesis, I already conducted an ethnographic study of a football team that was in grassroots football. So it was male elite football in Germany. And then for my PhD thesis, I conducted another ethnographic study that is set with a male professional football team from Germany. When I say ethnographic study, I mean that I collected audio recorded data, which is my first data source or my primary data source. Then I did observations and also interviews with players. So I was um, identifiable as the researcher on the scene, um, but I kind of just like moved around with the players and then started recording nearly everything they were saying. Um, so I was also in the locker room, I was on the substitutes bench and I got access to quite interesting spaces. And my main focus for my PhD thesis is how team cohesion is constructed and negotiated as a dynamic social process through language. But gender and also um, racialized discourse, gendered and sexualized discourse, they were kind of a byproduct of my uh, time with both teams. Hmm. Um, so it kind of like sprang at me, it emerged from the data and that's why I decided or I did focus um, for um, a paper and also just talks that I gave on gender and gender-based violence against women because being a female um, researcher among male and also masculine dominated uh, context did have some impact, not just on the research process, my own um, well-being as well, but also just the research outcome. And I believe it is very important to speak about issues like these because quite often football research is dominated by white um, senior male academics from sociology. And I think there is a definite need for change in there. So yeah, that's me. Wow, that sounds fascinating and congratulations. That's so exciting. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Claudia. Yes, hi, thank you so much for having me here. I am so honored and humbled to be amongst these great panelists and thank you uh, Fair, for having us. And yes, my name is Dr. Claudia Benavides Espinosa. I have been a professor for 10 years here at Arkansas State University. I am originally from Monterey, Mexico 
but I did my PhD studies at Texas A&M University in sport management. And my research is in sexual harassment in and around sports. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely part of the violence that women in sport face. And I say in and around sport because I go beyond the field onto the organization aspect of sport as well. And also interscholastic athletics, as well as not only athletes, but coaches and administrators, um, the fans, the referees. And most recently, one of my students and I just finished a research project on the sexual harassment of professional cheerleaders. And I'm currently working on, um, I think it's very interesting that Sol is working on cohesion because I'm working on how cohesion of all male teams, namely football, basketball, football as in American football, basketball, mm -hmm. or you know, those very male dominated teams uh, with those masculine cultures and cohesion on those teams affects uh, bystander reports of sexual harassments of women in and around those teams. And so I thought that was very interesting when you were talking, Sol. And then I am also working solo on a project for a book about media representations of sexual violence in sports. Wow, that hits a lot of things that I obviously care a lot about. So that's great. Uh, and last, certainly, when, um, last but not least, certainly is uh, Joyce. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you to FAIR and, and to my esteemed panel uh, colleagues. It's uh, also a real privilege and uh, pleasure for me to join this session today. I'm Joyce Cook. I'm uh, the first ever FIFA Chief Social Responsibility and Education Officer. I also sit on the Senior Management Board at FIFA. Um, I joined FIFA four years ago in November 2016. Coming from the NGO sector, I've got 20 years experience in the equality and diversity sector. I've actually previously been a director of FAIR, of women in football, um, and also set up and founded uh, a, a, an NGO specifically targeted at uh, improving accessibility for disabled people. I'm myself an openly gay disabled woman working in football. Um, it's very well known within FIFA and um, welcomed and um, I'm also, uh, my key responsibilities are human rights anti-discrimination, safeguarding child protection and sustainability in the environment and uh, in particular with my head of safeguarding we do provide support and care around our uh, uh, cases of abuse that are investigated by our ethics committee. Great, thank you. thank you so much. It's very exciting to be here with you all. Uh, I'm gonna do a little setup and then we're gonna get to the questions. And uh, I'd like to start by talking with you all about sort of what the issues actually are, how we diagnose them. And then I'd like to spend a fair amount of time at the end talking about how are we gonna fix this? Which I always think is the hardest part <laughs> to actually uh, deal with. So in the last year or so, we have heard horrific reports of sexual assault and abuse within women's football programs throughout the world, including Afghanistan, Haiti, and most recently Chile. But there have been reports from Gabon, Canada, and youth soccer there, Colombia, Ecuador. There's been sexual harassment case against the president of the Confederation of African Football. We've seen a whole host of things. In many cases, the administrators were either the people doing the harm, committing the violence, or ignoring it when it was reported. But sexism is a spectrum and we can put this kind of institutional harm and failure around gendered violence at one end of that, but there's a whole host of other actions that contribute to an entire sporting culture that's hostile to women or really more so anyone who's not a cisgendered man. And I wanna do a quick note here. I wanna acknowledge that we're probably gonna be talking in binary uh, terms a lot today, man and woman, but gender itself is a spectrum. And those who fall outside the main binary are particularly vulnerable to discrimination, harm and violence. So on the spectrum of sexism that we're talking about, there are more benign or I guess less violent, um, perhaps examples of things that constantly remind women that they're interlopers or outsiders within football, that the system itself was not built to include them. So examples like female journalists facing sexual harassment during uh, the 2018 FIFA World Cup, sexualized coverage of women athletes, sexist abuse that women officials face in matches and female fans deal with in the stands, the under-resourcing of women's sport throughout the world, the paltry amount of media coverage that it gets, and the lack of women in football leadership, especially women of color or ethnic minority women. Okay, so that's our setup here, right? Um, so let's dig deeper first and try to diagnose this issue a bit before we get to the solution part of it. 
Um, and this is a question that I get a lot. So it's always fun for me to actually ask other people this question to see how you answer it. Um, is gendered violence particular to sport or is it a wider uh, reflection of societal issues? Or perhaps, I think maybe the better question here is, in what particular ways does it manifest within sport or within football that we need to be paying attention to? And um, Saul, I'll throw it to you first. Um. Yes, first of all, thank you for like highlighting that we're speaking in bin non-binary uh, and binary terms, sorry, and that sexism is a spectrum and gender is a spectrum. So we have all like agreed on that. So I'm very happy about that. Um, I think gender-based violence that we're talking about today is both very uh, particular to sports, but also a societal issue. So research has shown that in many sports, especially uh, football, um, there's still, it is often still characterized by hegemonic notions of masculinity. So that would be the dominance of uh, cis male men over women and everyone um, included in the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. Um, because like discourses of uh, tough boys and real men are being reproduced on a daily basis. And often the result is that it is a heteronormatively constructed context. So meaning that heterosexuality would be understood as the norm and that would mean that it is expected from players and everyone operating in the field. Um, so in my research itself, I had gender and sexual identity very often indexed um, in discourse, not always explicitly, but very often implicitly. And that means that the context becomes a gendered context. And then we have a resulting number of challenges for female, not just researchers, but everyone operating in the field. So when I collected my data with the professional team, there was nearly all of the staff was male. Um, so there was only one uh, female physiotherapist and on the grounds of the elite academy where the first team, the second team and also the younger teams trained, there was no female teams on there. So it was a complete separation. And then the challenges for female researchers when I'm speaking about myself is that among others, you're being patronized, you're being marginalized and also uh, often subjected to sexist attitudes. Um, so I think like a certain amount of critical reflection is very necessary there. Um, and then obviously this is just scratching the surface because I'm not talking about sexual harassment but um, more of like sexist attitudes that are transported through language. But I would definitely say that it is heightened uh, in certain environments and football is one of them. Right, right. So it's a reflection of the world, but there's a specific way that it manifests within sports, especially men's sports. Yes. Um, Joyce, I want to throw it to you and I want to sort of open it up even uh, more, or maybe get more specific. I'm not sure which way it actually works, uh, but I want to talk about this. Is there a difference when we talk about youth sports versus professional sports or grassroots versus professional? Like, how do we think about, because we can talk about soccer uh, or football, um, but does this break down when we talk about the different levels of it? Are there differences that we need to be paying attention to? Thank you. I'd just like to come back a little bit on uh, your first question as well. Sure, of course. Um, certainly from our experience at FIFA to date, we're very clear, and I think that, that the evidence shows this, and when we look to some of our member associations, such as, of course, the uh, well-documented UK cases, the historic cases that came to light, this isn't something that is predominating uh, for women and girls. Indeed, boys and young men are abused and at risk as well, and I, I think we need to make that note whilst agreeing that uh, today we're very much focused on, on women and girls. Um, and just to add that, of course, yes, it is a societal problem, but of course, we recognize that sports provides, um, a, if you will, it's probably the wrong terminology, but almost a breeding ground in the sense that it is a place where, you know, there is an element of trust, particularly with our children and youth. And that brings me to um, those elements. Um, in regards of football and, and indeed any sport, I think we can say with uh, some conviction that this is a, a challenge across the grassroots all the way through to the professional game. And of course, some of the challenges, some of the issues, some of the requirements of preventative measures and safeguarding will relate very specifically to environments, but we can be assured that this is a challenge and an issue. Um, at FIFA, we um, put our hands up and said we probably came to this um, too, too late. But in 2018, we received a letter actually from the Scottish FA um, explaining what was happening in the UK and asking if we, and indeed the same to UEFA, could help. 
And we realized very quickly, I was asked to uh, take a lead on this, that we needed to embed safeguarding and, and to really step up um, in this regard. From the very beginning, from the very outset, the support came from the very highest entity, from the president at FIFA, the secretary general, and, and, and everybody. And we set about establishing a safeguarding department we now had a, have a head of safeguarding, Catherine, who joined us with a great deal of experience in uh, this sector, having previously worked at the UN, UNICEF and other NGOs in the field. Um, we have a, a senior event safeguarding manager, which brings us to the youth um, women's tournaments in particular. So all of our future tournaments, particularly starting with youth and women, will have embedded safeguarding and the possibility for anybody that is concerned uh, to be able to, 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 to share that concern during the tournament and very robust measures to uh, prevent um, as much as is ever possible and to safeguard against uh, um, any incidents occurring during the tournament. Um, in addition, we um, have just recruited a very experienced uh, capacity building and training manager. But one of the things we've realized is not only in sports, but across all sectors, safeguarding is still a relatively new element. And you know, if we turn to the Me Too movement in any sector, what we have to understand is we have to protect and prevent, and we can only do that if we are really mindful with, with really proper and robust safeguarding measures. So we're on a journey that we had a lot of work going on behind the scenes. We're just finalizing the development of a new uh, FIFA uh, Guardians, it's the name of our safeguarding program, Safeguarding in Sports Diploma. Um, we the first part of that course is, is an essentials to safeguarding. We're doing that with the Open University and with the help in the background of UNICEF UK, who are helping us to um, prepare all the content. And that will launch hopefully before the end of the year. Um, and that we're making an open learning experience for anybody that wants to take it, not only FIFA uh, members and those within the football family. So in all of those elements, we can be really sure we have a lot of work to do. And I think that anybody that believes this isn't a challenge for sports is really uh, still in, in a place of naivety. For sure it is. And what we need to do, and actually our own president, FIFA president Gianni Infantino, said this very firmly at, at the FIFA Congress a few weeks ago. We face up to the fact that, that this is a, an issue and our role is to do all we can to prevent and ensure a safe space. But it's going to take time and we've got to be really determined that when this occurs, that we really take the steps that we need to, to throw the perpetrators out of our sport for good. Um, so I think as a starting point, I think hopefully that answers somewhat some of the questions around the wider game um, and, and some of the steps we're taking. I'm very happy to dig into those things a bit further, um, a bit further in the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely want to come back to some of what you were talking about um, as we get further along. Claudia, I would like to ask you about um, this, this same question of, you know, what, what, what's going on particularly in sports. And I also um, want to ask about how race and sexuality and disability and class and all these sorts of other things, how those play a role in, in what's actually happening, right? Because we know that people from more vulnerable populations tend to be harmed more often, less likely to report all those sorts of things. So what are you seeing in your work within sport about what, what makes this space a particular problem area maybe? Absolutely, yes. So uh, just to reiterate what they were saying, what Joyce was saying, or what Saul was saying, um, there is definitely a, a, a mirror of what's happening in society, in sports, in terms of hegemonic masculinity, and how we're just, you know, going with the status quo, and just repeating what we're seeing on television and what we're seeing in the culture. It's just, sport is so, so visible right, at all mm -hmm. levels. And when something happens in sport, the media has a tendency to report on all of that, right? We make more mm -hmm. of a scandal out of it. So we make it so visible for everybody to see. Um, and so we magnify everything that happens in sport. And so I, don't, I, I, I want to make sure that it is very clear that it's not happening in isolation in sport. I think they did a wonderful job explaining that. I just wanted to say it in a different way. 
um, so that it was clear for everybody that's hearing us that it, it is happening across the board. However, we do make it a bigger issue when it is a sport. And I think it should be because, you know, it, it is potentially a catalyst for change because if we start changing mm. sport, then it has the potential to start seeping into society and transferring out to society. And we can be the catalyst for that change that we're looking for. But yeah, so Sol started about how, started talking about how different spectrums in the in the gender and sexual minority continuum sometimes are more vulnerable to um, because they don't conform right to what society is expecting as well you are a, a female so you should be particularly in these sports and you should be behaving these ways even when you are within this sports and you are a male so you should be behaving these ways and even to go beyond that, uh, developmentally speaking, not all male develop the same way, whether they're cisgender or, you know, any other gender um, <laughs> in the continuum. Not every female develops the same way. So when we're seeing people that are develop developing at a different rate, they are also going to be um, easy pickings or, you know, it's going to be compounding factors for them to, to be facing violence. And um, if you add that able, uh, able or disabled bodies, then that compounds on, on that. If you add that immigrant status or a different race, then it's going to add on that. Like their vulnerability is just going to be stacking onto each other because, because there is more to tag on um, to be able to almost bully or pick on. So it's not just about here, let me start with race, but then there also let me pick about, you know, that particular other characteristic that I see in you. And then this other one, and then this other one. And the negative effects, the research shows that the negative effects of say sexual harassment compound over time. So if you get yeah. harassed one mm -hmm. time, you have a magnitude of negative effects. But if you get harassed over and over and over and over again, then the magnitude of those effects magnifies over time to where you know you have all of all of this um that you get to a breaking point and the same could be said for the magnitude of the little negative effects that are affecting that are layering because of your different characteristics because of your race because of hmm. your gender because mm -hmm. of your sexual orientation because of your minority status or your immigrant status or the religion of your parents or the politics that you know you're involved with or whether you are an activist or not, or because you are not able-bodied or what, you know, or because mm -hmm. you have some sort of characteristic that is not considered normal in mm -hmm. today's society, um, whether it's a protected class or not. And so um, we as, as, you know, adults and, and as people who can have influence over these fields over, you know, these youth sports or uh, practitioners of some, port, some sort, we could kind of like try to make this or, or uh, standard or, or um, what is it called, banner or banner and try to make this, you know, awareness and just bring it to the light and make sure that everybody is aware that this, this happens and Joyce used the word naive misinformation is is you know our worst enemy right now we need to make sure that people are being trained properly not only on you know she was speaking about the safeguards for sexual abuse mm -hmm. and also um you know proper behavior proper interactions proper terminology because the the research shows that when um Special Olympic athletes are being trained by able-bodied coaches. They, they feel harassed not only by being mislabeled in their gender, but also being mislabeled in their disability. And hmm. so then they have, you know, they have this lack of uh, females in the field that Saul was talking about, right? Because they don't have women that are training them. They don't have women that are rehabilitating them. They don't have women administrators. And so the women are there, they're isolated. And so it's a prime uh, field for grooming, the, the grooming that Joyce was talking about. She called it a breeding ground, right? Um, and so it's a prime field for a prime environment for grooming these athletes and start isolating them from 
their sources of comfort and, and making them dependent on um, a, a male figure of, or, or woman figure, it can be anybody, of, of comfort and strength. And then this person, uh, whether they're aware of it or not, may start becoming abusive because they have this power. And if they don't have the training and they don't know that, hey, this militaristic training it, it is bordering in abuse, um, if they're doing it unintentionally, then you know, if nobody's training them on that, then it was just a matter of the circumstances, right? And then there are situations in which it is very much intentional violence, what is happening. And we definitely need to be uh, having training and safeguards for that and reporting mechanisms that are very clear and um, discipline mechanisms that are also very clear, quickly act upon. Yeah. No, I was just, my brain is like spinning. Like I have a thousand thoughts after everything that you just said. That was wonderful. And I want to, um, that was interesting where you were saying about the way that the more that you're harassed, the more, like the way that that builds over time, right? Um, but also talking about the fact that, and like with Saul's work, right, that there was a single woman within this male space. And I'm thinking about changing behaviors and we call it gendered violence in large part because the people perpetrating the harassment and the violence are men a lot of the time, right? Um, and so Saul, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about what the men should be doing. Like, um, I mean, we as women can sit around all day and talk about this, but like if we could actually solve it, we would have solved it, right? So um, can you talk more about your work within these, male locker rooms and like, how do we, where's the intervention here? How do we start breaking these, changing these behaviors, breaking these cycles so that, how do, how do we get the men on board? I guess, <laughs> like, like, how do we, <laughs> please yeah. fix this major issue for us right now, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, I think occupying a researcher role is kind of a tricky one because when I, as a woman, enter the environment of these men, I have this like idea of myself as an ethnographer that I'm not supposed to change the environment. I mean, obviously with my presence, I am changing the environment. And then there is the reality that I am researching is co-constructed between them as the researched and me as the researcher. But then this thing happens where you're caught between good research practice, which would mean that you're managing rapport with all the male um, yeah, participants of my research and my own feminist beliefs. And that can become an issue. Because at some points, mm. not just the players, but also staff, coaches from other teams, they, I don't know, for example, see you in the hallway and say like, oh, something pleasing to the eye again. So your professional identity is not co-constructed, but actually more of a sexualized or gendered identity is constructed. Or a player is saying uh, like, oh, you're meeting with her later, behave, or you've got a condom, uh, like a bucket of condoms ready already. So that happens. And then as a woman, or in my case, as a female researcher, you have to ask yourself like, okay, what do I do now? Like, do I not say anything? Do I tolerate it? Because that kind of feels like I'm labeling it as okay because sexist um, abuse or sexist discourse is normalized and it becomes accepted. And that way it is not challenged. But what happens if I challenge it? So I um, like wrote a paper about these two like different possibilities and what happened if I challenged it? So there was one, just to give you a small example, there was one situation it was after an away match um so we were all in a restaurant the whole team and then the coaches the therapist the kit manager everyone and me the only woman and it was a boisterous atmosphere and then um players were talking about i don't know have you heard about the ear flick it's happening a lot on pitches where like mm. yeah players like do punishments when someone is like oh okay yeah. sure yeah so you get a yeah. flick on the ear and then they were like talking about this flick on the ear and then someone made a suggestive remark um like using his fingers and then it was obvious that he was kind of insinuating um that he could do like a sexual pleasing um practice with his fingers and then he turned around to me and said like oh lady look away please and in that situation i felt like okay first of all form a lady then me as as the only female um like what do i do now because it's like you're being put on the spot so what do you do and then i decided to challenge mm -hmm. it because of my ethnographic insights into the environment and knew that their hierarchical structure was highly based on age. So, and I was the oldest one among the players. 
So I said to him that, um, like, because I'm older than him, mm -hmm. that I, I should be prone to this uh, sex talk. And that actually, like, I, I'm, I would argue that I gained respect with the players because I was able to use their normative tone or their rough tone and put down humor, which is so stereotypically associated with like a masculine style of discourse. So when you know a context very well, that makes it easier to challenge it. But what happens if you don't? That just becomes like a little bit harder. And I think just like talking to people in the sense of like, I designed um, a workshop that I um, kind of talked with the head of the Elite Academy about like, how, how do we do this? Like, how do we actually get the players, but also the coaches, but the players to understand the power of language? Because many players don't really understand that what they are saying is actually racist or it's actually sexist. Like Claudia, what you were saying that like stuff is building up and it's like compounded into this like intersecting, like these intersecting factors that are being, the players are being discriminated against or discriminative. Um, and they don't see that. Like in one of my studies, I looked at racialized humor and then very, very often one particular player who was the only one from an East Asian country, um, he was targeted with uh, racist put down humor he was asked whether he was, for example, eating cats for breakfast so we can like play better. And that happened again and again. And then in interviews, the player said like, ah, oh, that's just part of the game. Like I know how it's meant. So every player I interviewed said mm. that it's never meant serious. And like, while I understand that, that it's never meant serious, um, it, it's still an issue because they are keeping these discriminatory stereotypes alive and then they're being accepted and normalized. So that becomes a problem. Yeah. And if we if we do like training and workshops um, with players, but also with coaches, because I think there's a little bit of a difference uh, how we can approach things. Um, I, I think like just sensitizing people towards what they're actually doing and what gender is, what sex is, what sexuality is, mm -hmm. just education could be the key there to prompt a change because um, obviously we as women can't do that alone or women plus um so yeah yeah and it's like we're not all having the same conversation all the time right uh yeah. on some level there needs to be a 101 like what even is consent uh we mm -hmm. act like that's something we all just understand and in fact as soon as you start questioning anyone about it you you find out that uh oftentimes they have a very different understanding than you do yeah. of it so yeah so education that's interesting and we're going to come back um to that but joyce i wanted to ask you about um holding people accountable i mean you mentioned that tossing people out when they've harmed um but like how do we really do that and i'm and i mean that like people who inflict harm but what do we do about fans or someone in leadership like we're we're handling these issues in, with different groups and it it, there can never be sort of a blanket response to gendered violence because everything is often so individualized in the way, like Saul was talking about, the ways that these um, things happen. So how do we think about accountability in, in these spaces and for all these different groups of people who might actually be doing the harm? Thank you, Jessica. And I think there's uh, an array of different elements to pick up on, but it does start with education. It starts with education internally within the uh, sports organizations, be it FIFA, our member associations, clubs, academies, um, and indeed across any sport, um, with parents, uh, with kids themselves in terms of children, with um, each of us, you know, um, it's often that women don't support other women still, and there are lots of layered reasons for that, and we understand them, but we have to support each other. Um, we are and we need to bring men into the discussion and, and uh, there are plenty of men an increasing number of men who are very forward thinking and very supportive of what we're all trying to achieve and they have an important role to play as well. But people have to understand what harassment and abuse is, what it means, and we have to be courageous and call it out when it happens. And as organizations, as FIFA, uh, as any sporting body, we have to ensure that we provide the mechanisms and the confidence for people to be able to report and, and to feel able to report. And as you said, that we um, 
show and we demonstrate that we take such allegations seriously and that we are prepared to investigate them. And indeed, that's a journey we're on at FIFA um, in, in some cases, in very severe cases of abuse. And I, I hate to use that terminology because any case of abuse or harassment is relative to the person that is exposed to it. And, and, and you know, as you've said, it, it, it can have a layered um, um, reaction. Um, it often starts perhaps with, you know, a small girl or a small boy in, 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 who is desperate to play football. And it may be very, um, uh, it may appear something relatively harmless at first, but, it, but in fact, it really isn't. Um, you know, I've certainly sp spoken to survivors, and I'm sure you all have. And uh, those st stories and the journey and the grooming and all of those elements are um, themselves compelling in, in why we need to really ensure that we, um, I know I keep saying it, embed preventative measures, safeguarding measures in all elements. We also have to ensure we have proper reporting lines and that everybody feels confident to be to report whether they witness harassment or abuse or whether they themselves are subjected to it. And that's a journey we're all on if we're really honest about that. Yeah, and I think one thing that I found doing this work over the last seven years is that one of the hardest parts is that the change is often slow as people are being harmed and it feels like we need it all to change we need it all to change right now immediately but actually changing these things takes so long and I think it's hard to sit with the fact that there are people being harmed in the meantime I think that's that's something that I grapple with personally when I think about this um before we get into like talking a little bit more specifically about action. I did, Claudia, I really did want to ask you a question about the media. I spend a lot of time writing about this publicly, uh, thinking about how to write about it. How do I, how do I mitigate harm as, I, as I'm doing this work as much as possible? Um, what ways do you think that media coverage perpetuates some of these issues we were talking about? And are there ways that it can actually be a part of the solution? Yeah, so... Uh... Man, it's just yeah. <laughs> that big is question. A big and a hard question. Yes, more more times than not, I would like to see. I would like to see um, media refer to to harassment or abuse survivors as targets. Maybe you know because they nobody wants to be referred to as a victim, right? And so or or. Um, anything that puts them in a vulnerable position. And so things of that nature are, are very important. And as, as I, I don't know how to answer that question because your duty is to report what actually happened. And it can be very triggering to a target to see their abuse display for everybody to see, right? And, and so um, maybe it, it as you display all of this abuse for them to see, for, for people to see, also, you know, call it what it is. And, and say, you know, you can't accuse anybody, right? Because you are not jury, juror, and executioner, but say, as, as we don't know if these accusations are true, the behavior that is being described is classified as this, this, and this, like call a spade a spade, right? Um, so that, not, not to say that the, the target is not telling the truth, but validating that what they went through um, was harmful and was, you know, is, is um, legally defined as this or psychologically in the literature defined as this and validating what they're feeling, validating what, what, the negative consequences are. And something very important to notice too is um, that a lot of the times when people are being harassed, it's easier for people around them to notice than it is for the people that are going through it because they tend to defend, right? If, if an athlete is being sexually abused by the coach, the athlete may think they're in a relationship. Like they may not realize that the coach is doing this to three or four athletes. And that it's mm. pro quo harassment. Like you get this special treatment because we have this exchange of this for that. Um, and so, and I'm doing this with three or four athletes at a time. 
And so other people bringing it to the attention um, is important. I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. That was not part of your question. Um, I just realized that because- No, that you're was, fine. That was, <laughs> but yes, so I, I think that it's very important that as, as your duty is to report what happened or what is being said, and you, I don't necessarily think you'll have a choice on that matter, still validating what the athlete is going through as, as trauma and, you know, because you can give them counseling or you can offer them counseling, but you can validate their very negative consequences and their, their feelings and um, their pain and their losses, you know, the loss of coming forward as a, as a target of abuse makes the team take sides, right? Immediately, like that, that immediate consequence when you say, coach did this to me, people in the team are going to say, yes, he did it to me too, and immediately go with the athlete, or absolutely not, I have not seen that, and immediately side with the coach. And so this athlete is going to lose their teammates. Administrators are going to side one side or, or, or another. As much as they want to remain partial, we are all humans and we are internally going to, you know, and so they are going to lose some connection and some resources. And so they need some validation from, from someone and they are going to feel that they lose more by being uh, potentially, I I'm, don't want to make a sweep generalization that everybody's going to feel this way, but potentially they're going to feel that they're losing so much more by being so publicly exposed that validation of what they're going to being public as well might help. Can I pick up on this, if I may, as well, yes. because we've had some experience um, in this regard, and, and I think this is a really, really important point. You know, uh, documentaries like Athlete A, you know, I, I'm sure we all do. I always say to someone that doesn't yet understand, watch that. However, the, the media has a great responsibility here, too. And I personally am really concerned, um, and I fully on a personal level, and, and we recognize at FIFA the importance of investigative journalism. That goes as a given. But in some of these media reports, the, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done by media, by those that report, to ensure that they use safeguarding measures too, and they provide a duty of care to any um, victim, survivor, or witness that speaks to them. And the reason I say this is we have had an experience where we have um, spoken off record with the journalist, I, I myself have done that, to ask that they don't uh, report a certain allegation at that time for fear of repercussions to the victims on the ground. And the story was reported. It, it frankly, in my view, was irresponsible. And lo and behold, two days later, I got a call from the same journalist asking for urgent help because one of those that had been exposed by the story had been very seriously threatened. And we had to mobilize very immediate care, psychological support and safe refuge. And I think any journalist has got to be mindful when they report these cases of that responsibility. And I think like all of us, the media are on a journey here too. But, you know, we... Um, respect and I respect when we see really mindful journalism that really takes care of the victims and survivors but that isn't always the case at this stage and sometimes in the shorter term that can do more harm and whether it be a storyline that's uncomfortable for FIFA indeed any sport is irrelevant the biggest priority is those themselves that are the victims of abuse and we really need to keep that as our first priority and uh, you know and I repeat what I said at the start mindful journalism like athlete A, absolutely 100%, but in some cases, in that, you know, responsibility of reporting, there has to be also a duty of care, and it isn't always the case. Yeah, and I'll just say, there are a lot of, um, media has its own problems in diversity, and so um, we talk about who's actually telling these stories um, yeah, are, are not necessarily people who in their personal lives are thinking about these things all the time. Right. Um, I do want to get to talking about how, 
how can we fix this? And we've touched on this in certain ways, safeguarding education, things like that. But we got a good question from the audience and I'll read that and then um, Joyce, I'm probably gonna throw this to you first, but it says in Colombia, there are not proper reporting lines and I believe trust and leadership to report is essential. In Colombia, in Colombia, leaders don't lead by example. How can FIFA make these people accountable or even us normal citizens? Specific, especially when, for example, people calling out discrimination sometimes are stigmatized and stereotyped. So like one of my questions that I had for you is it's good to create more, uh, we want more people to report. Right, that's always one of the big issues within gendered violence. It's massively underreported, um, but there has to be a lot of trust in the system and trust on. It's not enough to have a place to report or even trust the person that you're reporting to. It's knowing that that's going to enter into a system that you don't necessarily trust. Uh, and so, what do we? Yeah, what do we do if um, leadership? If we don't have, if we don't trust the leadership, that's then going to take actually do the investigation and, and hand out the punishment? What do we do about accountability in this way? Um, I'd like to start by saying that we moved, um, really we learned a lot in the Afghanistan case and we've moved to a survivor-centered approach. We've had help and support from um, some of the NGOs, from Human Rights Watch and, and some of those that are really involved in this area and they've helped us on that journey. And it's been a lesson of learning how important that is. Um, we also recognize that there is a need for safe reporting. And I think the first thing any of us do and should do is to put ourselves in the shoes of somebody who is a victim of harassment or, or abuse. So you may well have seen that, um, again, our, our FIFA president called for a consultation process that we are launching together with like-minded sports partners um, and govern governing bodies um, and along with uh, the support of the likes of UNODC. We actually announced this at our press release when we signed an MOU with them not so long ago. And our intention is to look very seriously at whether sports should come together with governments and actually establish an international safe sports entity would have to have a very mm. definite mandate because we wouldn't want it to become something that be became, you know, crumbled before it started. But what we would foresee that as is a space where anybody can more comfortably report from any sport. You know, if, if I'm uh, a, a, a victim, am I going to re report within the family of where this abuse is happening? Probably not. Probably not. Um, so we're really looking at this very intently. What we also understand is there has to be multiple ways to report and there has to be the opportunity for that very early psychological and counselling support when somebody reports. That makes it very difficult for any sports governing body to do this well and to gain the trust. And, and it will take probably a long time for any sport to gain absolute trust for all of the above reasons. So we're really keen to, to, to sit around the table and see if this is possible. We will be launching in the next few weeks the consultation process, as I said, and then our intent is to form a working group. So not only would that be a space to, 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 to more confidently and confidentially uh, report, to be able to do so in your own language much more easily and so on, but we also see that as a place where um, investigators can be mobilized locally. And what I mean by that is expert investigators. Sports does not have the competency to have proper trained psychologists and human rights lawyers investigating these cases. And it isn't always possible to investigate cases in countries where there are established and well-developed statutory agencies, child protection agencies, uh, crime units that specialize in, in abuse cases and so on. And that makes it actually very tough for a sport to investigate and do their job. And what we have started to do is actually to work with really trusted and due diligence um, psychologists and investigators that specialize in abuse cases to help us in, in investigating cases when we get them. Um, in answer to, to, to the person that's um, presented from Colombia, Again, part of our training and, and capacity building is to embed and ensure that our member associations understand their responsibilities. 
but we have to face the fact this isn't going to change overnight. But there are other means to, to report cases of abuse. And, you know, we have to remember this is a crime when this happens. And it isn't always feasible that somebody feels competent to, to report to statutory agencies, or as I've just said, that they are competent. But please, you know, you can report to FIFA. We will look at the cases. We do have um, a requirement that we have to wait three, three months to take a case up if we don't believe that it's been properly managed. And we do try to work in a really collaborative way in building the capacity within our confederations and member associations to be able to properly and fairly investigate any cases or reports of abuse and harassment. I don't know if that answers the question, but... Um, Thanks, Joyce. I, I think, and I'm, you certainly don't have to answer this question because of uh, your position, but I do have these moments, like when we're talking about this issue and all the things that you just laid out and it's super complicated and it's really hard and people are being harmed. And there is a part of me that wonders, I mean, I am part of a podcast called Burn It All Down. Uh, so maybe this makes sense, but there is a part of me that wonders if reform is even possible. Um, within these systems that were not built to deal with any of these issues that weren't even built to include women in the first place, forget all of these larger societal sexism, misogyny, all these things that are happening to them. And there's a part of me that wonders if like, do we, is reform ever going to be enough, right? Um, is it that we actually have to torch things and then rebuild anew? And that's terrifying because we don't know what that would look like and how that would function. But it seems like everything is it's not great now either, right? Um, and reform has so long, we have so far to go. Um, okay, we have a ton of- I yeah. just wanna quick, quickly come back on that. I mean, we are making quite, I mean, you know, please take my word for it. We're making seismic changes at FIFA and we're realizing and learning very quickly and we're really prepared to learn and to get better at, 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 at this. Um, and I think we need to remember all of the other elements of sport and, and the positives they bring, the growth of the women's game, the investment in the women's game, the empowerment. You know, I think earlier we spoke about, um, I'm not sure we said role models, but we talked about male physios. Well, we know very well we need to encourage more women into sports, into football, um, in these roles. And, you know, when you look at, at the medical um, training and, and medical school, in most countries, it, there are more women than men, and yet we see very few female doctors in sports and indeed certainly in football. So there's a lot of work we've got to do in all of the elements, but I don't think we should burn anything down. I think there are a lot of very positives. <laughs> and we shouldn't give up because we, we are making a lot of progress and we're talking with our colleagues in other sports at the IOC and elsewhere. And there's a lot of focus on ensuring that we really work hard to get better at all of this. So, um, so please don't give up, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not giving up. Um, Claudia. Yes, I was going to say, turn FIFA down quite yet. Um, <laughs> I think that's a great idea how they're consulting with external people and external professionals and bringing them in. I wonder if um, an alternative to that could be just a consideration, you know, to have an external committee with representatives brought in from the different sports that you want to get. Um, you know, represented into that committee to look at the harassment, at the harassment reports, and it be the majority of people not be from, you know, that house sport that you were talking about, or in sport, just be a committee of people external to sport. Hmm. So, so our ethics chamber is indeed that it's an independent chamber of a proper judge, proper lawyers that, 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 that in all effect, these cases are treated like they are treated, you know, when, when they're brought to, to, to a courtroom. So it's the same process. It's those on the ground that we're mobilizing to to speak with the witnesses, victims, and to make sure that there's the proper care and support beforehand, because you can't just ask somebody to give testimony. And, and that's what we have to stop happening, because I think that is probably historically how it was, because that's when we run into all of the, 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 the issues that, that do occur. Uh, Saul, I wanted to come back to your point about education. And I think that's Yes, I think education and prevention is such a huge part of this and often is um, left out, right? We have a lot of punitive responses to, to these issues. Um, we're set up for that. But like in, in your mind, who would be doing this educating? Like who makes the most sense for, for talking 
to people about this? Because on some level, I think coaches make sense. But then as you were talking about, coaches need education too. So like, in what way can that be the most impactful? And then I did just want to throw this out. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but we had a great question about what role do you feel social media has in the fight to combat gendered violence in football or helps perpetuate it? And I didn't know if you had seen anything in your work about that. Mm, thank you. Um, so, I mean, education, yes. Coming from the educational sector, I believe it's key. And education has to start at different points. It has to like begin in school. It has to start in like like smaller football clubs, the grassroots level, the professional level. Um, in the football club that I have worked with, they had media training, which I think is uh, key. But it was more on like how do I behave? In mm -hmm. like it it covered a lot of areas, and uh, I, I think that's really important, and it should continue. But I don't know how it is in other countries, but from Germany, I know that when you have an elite academy and in order to get it relicensed every year, um, there's like the star system. So you get different stars um, as your licensed elite academy. And then they have a number of points that they have to fulfill. And one is education. So I don't, I wouldn't know because I, I'm not prone to any governing bodies, but I wouldn't know who sure. could say this, but to make it mandatory that they have education from external people um, like Joyce was saying, external, I think, is the key um, that they come in and deliver training. And I believe um, that training, first of all, the staff, and I would want to talk to the coaches themselves because I designed the training solely for coaches, because I think coaches very often, if they're not the people who are actually doing um, the gender based violence, um, they are often the people that athletes would turn to. And then mm -hmm. coaches need right. to be sensitized and actually know how to um just spot different gender-based violence cases within their team um but then i would want to talk to the team separately because i think that's very important because players often um like feel a little bit caged when the coaches are there that's how i felt like whenever i was alone with the players when we were for example they were on a run through the forest i mean i couldn't run i was on a bike but like to keep up with them but then they like ask questions to me directly and mm -hmm. they spoke differently than when the coaches were with us or in the locker room, they were different. And I think just talking to them in, a, in an atmosphere where it's really like, okay, let's talk just us. And let me show you some actually, like some actual evidence. Um, so I have done like with my research group, we are a sports culture and communication research collective at Warwick University. And we want to kind of promote um, social linguistic research in not just football but any sports we work together with um, the amateur boxing federation from uh, the uk and also uk coaching and we did deliver coaching on different aspects um, and that i felt like worked really well because we can show like okay let's talk about this and have it really like not just i'm going to talk to you but i'm going to talk with you so where is the line between banter and discrimination for example because mm -hmm. like one of right. my focus is, is humor. And then people say like, ah, oh, but it's, it's just humor. Yeah. Yeah. Humor is such an easy yeah. excuse, right? It's yeah. such a frustrating, easy excuse. Yeah. And I think just like talk about what language entails, not just language, but that that's my topic. So I'm going to bang yeah. on language all the time. <laughs> um, so I think that's really important to like get people on board and actually have external people come in like, I would say me, but <laughs> I mean, obviously there are other people, but just get people on board uh, from organizations like FAIR. Um, th there are different people that can actually be a great resource. Like there are great programs that we have, for example, in uh, the Netherlands, there's the Anna Frank um, Stiftung and they have this thing where they uh, talk to football fans. Um, and then it, it's about like mm. um, anti-Semitism and that works really well. There are really like good cases where um, there is a dialogue and that way education, I think, yeah, definitely is key. That's really smart. The idea of dialogue, that it's not just yeah. someone <laughs> speaking <laughs> at other people, but actually having a conversation about these things. Um, we did have a question about language and I think it's interesting. It says, I wonder whether the use of terminology so wide is not part of the problem. What do, um, what do we address under the umbrella of gendered violence? Uh, in sports, how do we tackle something that's described so differently depending on the person or specialist mm. who defines it, which is such a fascinating question because one thing that I found in my work is that there's all these different reporting systems. Um, and I often do collegiate 
here in the US. And so you'll have like the criminal, you'll then you'll have the actual college process. And then, um, and they use different terminology. And, uh, and I think that can be confusing. Claudia, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about language and um, this idea that it's actually confusing things. Yeah, and it is confusing. Um, it really is in the eye of the beholder. And unfortunately for the person that's the initiator of the language, that is very confusing because, you know, you can be like, hey, girl, and um, hey, girl, hey, girl. And the girl is like, I keep telling him no, and now I'm feeling harassed. And, and the poor guy is like, just, you know, trying to have some game. And so <laughs> mm, that is very frustrating also for academicians, but also it, it is important to have some empathy and to put to, to put each other on the other person's shoes, right? Like how, how much like persistence will you like if, mm -hmm. if you're in the shoes of the other person? And so let's try, and drawing that line is very difficult um, because some of the, some of the gender violence is very clear cut, right? Like assault, very clear cut. Um, exchanging sexual favors, for favoritism or uh, taking away consequences that you should have had for behaving a certain way, very clear cut. Something like uh, the occasional joke, the occasional you know red color joke in the work environment. Okay, does that is that harassment? Is it not like you know humor does confound things? Like it makes it a little bit harder to. And so it's always, and Joyce mentioned this, it, it, it's in the eye of the beholder. Like it's gonna be up to the person that is, that is um, feeling harassed, but also there can be certain behaviors in which um, two people are behaving a certain way and they don't feel harassed, but then a third person is watching and they're like, what is happening? Like that is completely inappropriate. And they themselves feel uncomfortable to the point that they don't wanna be in that locker room. And so, you know, then the behavior of these two people that are completely okay with it is harassing to the rest of the people in the environment. And so it's always, it's always from the perspective of psychologically speaking, I don't know legally, um, it's always from the perspective of the person that's feeling those negative consequences. And so they are the ones that get to draw the line on what they consider appropriate or inappropriate, fortunately or unfortunately for the, the initiator. Um, so yeah. it's not clear cut there because it's on an individual basis and that's going to vary based on their experiences in the past. You know, some people have had so many horrific experiences that they're so callous to it that they don't care or that they're so hyper aware of it. Yeah, they're sensitive. Everything, right. Mm -hmm. Everything sparks, a, a, everything is a trigger. And so what makes that difference? Um, it, it's individual. Right. Which may be part of what we need are clear policies. And again, going back to the education and like how this is being communicated, you know, I think so much about the fact that like we need consent 101. We don't have good ideas about boundaries in general in lots of ways in lots of places. Um, this stuff is so big, like on some level it hurts me because it's so basic. It feels mm -hmm. like we could just fix these very really basic things, but because they're so basic, they're just baked in. And it's like, what, <laughs> what do we do about that? It can be, it can feel so frustrating. Um, right. I wanted, when, yeah. when you add in technology and it's like, would you look at the shot? And it's, you know, somebody's behind on the shot. And it's like, um, you know, does that, yeah. was that okay with you sharing a picture of their behind, like mm -hmm. as they were squatting? Um, let's think about this thing. <laughs> right. Add, consent on that as well I mean I know it's your picture but it's there behind so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I mean it's not funny but I under like it is just um again it feels it feels like it should be easy on some level and then when you're in the moment and you're dealing with individualized cases it can feel incredibly complicated and nuanced and I think that's part of the struggle too um it's easy from far away to sort of explain how these things should work. And then once you're actually in the moment, it, it becomes much more difficult to parse all of this out. I did wonder, um, are there different approaches that are required for reaching fans 
versus players versus coaches versus leadership and decision makers like people at FIFA or the IOC or something like that? Like, what are the different appro approaches that we should be thinking about when it comes to fixing this? Because I mean, Figure does a lot of great work about you know fans in the stands and but also like how media is doing this and it just feels like we have all these different avenues and how do we this is a huge sporting culture that we're talking about so what are these different approaches that we need in order to sort of start dismantling these issues in these different places and Joyce I'm sure you have thoughts on this I mean, you know, we keep coming back to the education and I think it's education across the board and it's impact. I think one of the things perhaps we haven't done as sports before, and, you know, I've been looking at this quite closely, is um, really, really explain this in real detail. What is racism? What is sexism? Um, what can we do as individuals about it? And this is an area of work we're looking at very intently at the moment at FIFA. So I would just say watch this space. Um, but how can we empower both the individual and the collective to 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 to, to play a, a role in this? And all of us, you know, I, I'll put my own hands up, you know, it, but probably much less now, um, if not never, because I'm very sensitive about it. But um, you know, I, I'm I've dismissed a comment and thought oh, they didn't really mean it. And actually, you know, it's probably I've gone home, it's played on my mind, and I've been pissed about it because it's been inappropriate and I think sometimes um, in the past if I'm honest uh, before I came to FIFA I may have been in a room where that happened and it was really as I began to really understand much more about all of these areas and as I grew older and more confident in myself that I felt able to challenge so I think we've got to empower fans parents coaches, everybody in the process, and we have to be able to allow them to ask, you know, you talked about language. It's okay to ask, you know, I always say this as a disabled person, it's okay to ask me if what, how you say something is okay or not. I'd much rather you do that than feel uncomfortable to speak to me because you're uncomfortable because I'm sat in a wheelchair or, or whichever. And I think most people would feel the same as long as it's done in, in a, a really uh, space of, of, of really good intent. And of course, that may not always be the case. So again, it gets complicated. But I, but I think in addition, you know, we um, in sports governing bodies have got to really ensure that we embed this through all of the elements of sports and in football. We're now looking, for example, at agents and, and putting some mandates on agents going forward. Um, so, you know, we're looking in all of these areas to, to, to at ways we can strengthen and improve. And I think what we'll see in the future, we have to build the capacity first, is more mandates around what is required. UEFA has put in to its club licensing example, not a must at the moment, but it should have um, a safeguarding officer in, in clubs. And it's something we're looking at closely as well. So I think there's a lot of ongoing work. Um, that's an easy place to, to, to sit as if, uh, well, that's okay, you, you've ticked that box, but it is really intense work. There is really a big focus on this. And uh, it's something in football that we're certainly driving from the very, uh, as the governing body from the top, if you will, at FIFA. Yeah, which we need that, right? We need the guidance from the top as much as we yeah. need people from below telling us what it is that they actually need. Yeah. So I have to wrap this up. Um, this has been wonderful. It's been a real honor to share this space with you, Joyce, Saul, and Claudia. I wanna thank FAIR again for hosting this and having this important and difficult conversation. Everyone should continue to tune in to um, Football People Festival. And again, the hashtag is Football People, all one word. And I just wanna say that FAIR is one of these great resources that they do a lot of this work around how, how we have more equity and inclusion within the global game of football. And so we, can, we should certainly be turning to them when we're looking for some of the answers um, as we begin to slowly um, break up um, break up what's been happening and and build better systems. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Fair. Thank, thank you, fellow panel members. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody that listened to us. Thank you. Hope to speak to you again soon. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.